Hello from the Visitor Center. Hello, Lizzie. How are you? I'd like to welcome you and all of our fourth graders from Grace Phil Elementary in Santa Paula to Channel Islands Live. And we are live and interactive, so let me hear everybody shout out a big hello and say hi to Ranger Dave. I'm Ranger Dave. Hello! <laughs> Hello, and we also have, watching today, some visitors here on Anacapa Island, and that's where I'm at. I'm actually underneath Anacapa Island. This is one of five islands that makes up Channel Islands National Park, and it's not just the islands above us, but it's the waters surrounding them that are part of this park. Half of this park is water, and in addition to those of you participating with us today from our Visitor Center Auditorium in Ventura and those of you watching on the island, I want to say a big hello also to everybody who's watching us live over the internet today. And I want to thank our tech partners, Ventura County Office of Education and Explore.org for making it possible for all of you to come on a dive here in this national park. But unlike me, you don't have to get wet or be cold. And so, today, we're diving, as I mentioned, in a national park. These waters are also part of Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And this particular spot in the Anacapa Island Landing Cove is also protected as a marine reserve. Ranger Lizzie, does anybody know what a marine reserve does? What is it for? Stand by, Dave. Okay. I think we're not sure over here. Well, in a way, I'm glad because it helps me to educate you about what a marine reserve is. It's an area in the ocean that fishing is not allowed in. So even though this is part of a national park and a national marine sanctuary, fishing is still allowed in some of the waters out here. But this particular area, it is not allowed in and hasn't been allowed for over 30 years. So that's your entire lives, all of you from Graceville, plus more. Maybe not all of your teachers, but for all the students. And because of that, the waters here, this forest that we're diving in, has a much more naturally functioning and well-balanced ecosystem than areas outside of the reserve. Now, I mentioned I'm diving in a forest. So if you guys know what kind of forest I'm diving in, just go ahead and everybody just shout it out. What kind of forest is this? Kelp forest, that's right. And a kelp forest is actually a forest. It is home to many animals. In fact, there's a lot of diversity here. There are over a thousand different kinds of living things here in the kelp forest. But it's underwater, so it's very different than the forest you might go hiking in on the mainland near your homes, pine forests or oak woodlands. And kelp has adapted to this marine environment in a few ways. So let me show you one of the ways Instead of having a rigid, solid trunk that's stiff, kelp has these bands of flexible, tube-like things called stipes. And they allow the kelp to move back and forth when the swell or the surge down here is pushing on it. Also, on land, most of the nutrients are in the soil. So land trees and land plants have roots to drop the nutrients and the moisture. But here, all of those things are in the water around us. So kelp has these leaf-like blades that actually, along with the stipes, can absorb nutrients right out of the water. So these are adaptations that enable the kelp to really thrive here in this environment. Now there's one other interesting adaptation. It's these little bulb-like things. They're called pneumatocysts, and they're filled with air. And does anyone know, Lizzie, does someone in our audience in Ventura know what 
what is the purpose of this adaptation? It's to help the plants breathe. Well, actually plants do breathe. They use a process called photosynthesis, and this is linked to that. It's not actually what allows us to breathe, but they use something, and these bulbs filled with air float the cup up to the surface, and our photographer, Ranger Kelly, is going to aim the camera up, and everybody shout out, what is it that the cup is reaching for at the surface? Sunlight. Now, I heard someone say oxygen, and oxygen is a part of this breathing, if we want to call it that process, photosynthesis for the plant. It actually, through those bulbs, floats up to the surface. It's anchored to rocks on the bottom through a structure called a holdfast that hooks it to the rocks. And when it gets to the surface, it spreads out, and it gets sunlight, and that sunlight is used through that process of photosynthesis to create glucose or sugars and also oxygen. In fact, kelp and other marine algae, this is actually not a plant, it looks like one perhaps, but it's a giant algae, they produce over half of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. Right down here in the ocean, they produce oxygen for us on land. So this is not just an important habitat for the animals that live down here, but it's important for us as well. So why don't we go ahead and drop down to the seafloor, and we have, I think I'm wrapped in the kelp, so I'll have to get loose from that, but we have a team of support divers down here, and let's see if they can find some of the creatures that actually rely on the kelp forest for their very survival, for habitat, and for food. So we're going to make our way over here, I think, Kelly, and we'll find a nice area to settle down in on the bottom. And you can see, I picked this spot because there is a rock here. And we can see, actually, this is making it easy for me, I think. I can pick this rock up, and you can see the hold fast the structure that anchors kelp to the rocks. This is a small one hooked to a little rock, but it still works like an anchor. Bigger strands of kelp have bigger holdfasts that actually act like little habitat, habitat structures, and all kinds of things live even in the holdfast, very small organisms. So that's the kelp. You can also see this rock here covered in other kinds of algae, and you'll notice that here in the ocean, in this kelp forest, there's very little surface area that isn't covered with some kind of life. So there's all kinds of different things, diversity of life, but there are all kinds, but there's also this abundance. And so there's competition, and there's a balance and an interplay between the animals, and I'm going to call in one of our support divers, Dan, and he has a couple of animals. Thank you, Dan. And everybody go ahead and just shout out if you know, what am I holding in my hands? Yeah. Urchins, yeah. They look like pin cushions a little bit. These are two different kinds, and they're animals. And, you know, in the kelp forest, the kelp is a producer. It produces food. And do you think these are producers, or are these consumers? Consumers! You guys have done a little prep work. For early in the school year, that's really good. So these consume. Let's keep going with that line of thought. What do they consume? Kelp! Kelp! Wait. These are grazers. They consume the kelp, so they'll eat kelp. Now, they're important for the balance of life here. There are animals that eat these, that prey on them. So predators rely on this species, these species, but they rely on the kelp. So indirectly, the predators also rely on the kelp for survival. Without kelp, there wouldn't be as many urchins for them to eat. Now, they're very different, these two kinds of urchins. In my right hand is a purple urchin, and in my left hand is one that's called a coronado urchin. And you can see the difference in size and color 
and the length of their spines. And so there's diversity even among different kinds of animals with multiple species. And if you have a simple change in the balance of how many of which kind or which species of urchins live in the kelp forest, it can have a drastic and dramatic effect. These little purple urchins, unlike some other species, will actually eat the whole fasts as well as graze on the blades of the kelp or bits of the blades that break off. So if too many of the larger urchins and some of the larger species are fished, red urchins in particular, people eat those in sushi restaurants, then purple urchins fill the void, and if that balance changes, purple urchin populations can skyrocket, and then they can destroy a kelp forest by eating all the holdfasts. So a real simple thing, how many of what kind of urchins are in the kelp forest can make the difference between a healthy, lush forest like this, or an area where the rocks are just covered with thousands of purple urchins and nothing else. So I'm going to actually call in... Ranger Dan and give the urchins back to him. Now, why do you think I'm giving the urchins back to Dan as opposed to just putting them on the bottom so they could eat the algae? Lizzie, does someone know? Because if you leave them on the ground, um, they will start eating the kelp. Well, they will start eating the kelp, and that's what they do, so that is actually okay. But those urchins... Remember I mentioned there are predators down here that like to eat the urchins. And there's a fish called a sheephead that has been swimming around me. I don't see it right now because it wants to eat those urchins. And I don't want to give it a free lunch. It has to earn its lunch. So Dan is going to put those urchins in a safe place in a little crevice so that we as park rangers and divers showing you the kelp forest don't affect the life down here in any negative way. So we're being careful to help protect all of the animals here. Now, I'm going to laugh a little bit because check this out. <laughs> I know you know what this is, so go ahead and shout out. What am I holding? And I know I watched last week. It looks really good on camera. It looks pretty mean with these teeth. And I'm showing this for a couple reasons as an example. So we found this down here in the kelp forest last week. We didn't bring it with us. And so this, even though this is sort of a fun toy that someone was probably playing with and lost here, or maybe it floated out all the way from the mainland, or maybe it swam. But even though we're in a protected area, there are still threats to the kelp forest here. And believe it or not, this... Toy Shark is one of them. This is, even though it's a fun thing to have, we brought it back down to show you today as an example. This is a pollution item. This is a piece of plastic that doesn't belong here. And this shark itself is probably not hurting that much. But little pieces of plastic, some of the animals eat those, and it causes them harm. And so even though we're offshore and in a protected area, there are still threats here. And so today we're going to explore not only the life down here, but we're going to see about a couple of those other threats and see if there are some simple things that we can all do to help protect the kelp forest. But <laughs> I didn't just come here to show you toys, and so let me give that shark back to Dan and trade it for a real shark that I'll show you. And we'll give it just a second to get acclimated. This shark is called a, anybody know? Do you know the name of it? Here's a clue. I think we're not shark. quite sure. It's a horn shark. Look at this horn on its dorsal fin. There's another one on its back fin. And that's where it gets its name. And we'll get a head on shot. This shark seems to like being in the limelight. <laughs> it's pretty happy here. But how many of you, just shout out if you would like to go swimming like we are today in shark-infested waters. And I'm not talking about toy sharks. I, I don't know why, Rachel Lizzie, I always expect everybody to say, no, we don't want to swim with sharks. We're afraid of sharks. But everybody always says yes. And actually, yes is not a bad answer. There are some species of sharks that could be a threat to us. 
but you know what is a bigger threat? We are a bigger threat to sharks. This shark, I'll show you its mouth on the bottom, is a bottom-feeding shark. It eats small crustaceans, little fish, mollusks, things like that, that are in the sand. And it usually comes out at night to feed. It really poses no threat to us. But humans kill millions and millions of sharks every single year. I think the number, we were looking at it on the internet recently, is something like 14,000 an hour worldwide. Sharks are killed many times just for their fins. And the rest of the shark is discarded. So that's another threat to the kelp forest. This area is protected from fishing, but do you think that nobody ever fishes here? Or do you think sometimes people violate the rules and do fish in the reserve? Unfortunately, now I'm going to give this shark back to, actually let's hold on for one second because I want to make one more point. The fishing, even though sometimes people do poach in the reserves, one of the things that we do, and also the State Department of Fish and Wildlife and other agencies, is patrol and try to protect and keep people from fishing in the reserves and informing them if they don't know. And sometimes we have to cite them if they are doing it knowingly. But also, just by having reserves, we have areas where these fish can live unharassed, not be taken out of the waters, and grow to be large and old and have a large population and help keep fish numbers at an appropriate level. And so having protected areas helps protect against overfishing. So let me go ahead and give the shark back to Rachel Dent for the same reason we gave him the urchin so that he can put the shark back into a nice safe place because it normally during the day will be in a small crevice or a crack and hiding out. So we've discussed a couple of the threats to the kelp forest, and now I see that Ranger Dad's been very busy. I actually had to hold him off a minute ago, and let's see if, whoops, <laughs> nice catch. That was, we call that a save down here. So go ahead and shout out what, a, what animal am I holding now? <laughs> And this is a California spiny lobster. I'm going to just tuck his tail in a little bit. And this animal is another story about the importance of protected areas and how marine reserves help protect the diversity of life and the abundance of life down here. It doesn't have claws like a lot of the lobsters you'll see in New England or in your grocery store or on a dinner plate in a restaurant. Instead, it has these sharp horns and bumps on its shell that help to protect it. And it has these long antenna in the front that act as sensory organs to help it to find its way and find food and navigate through its territory. But lobsters, like many marine animals, the older they get and the bigger they get, and this is a medium size male lobster. Let's open the tail and you can get a look at how long it is. The bigger they get, the more offspring they produce. And not just for here in the reserve, but those larvae will drift way offshore. And as they grow into lobsters, into adult lobsters, they make their way back all up and down the coast. So protected areas like this help to populate populations of lobsters and other animals outside of the reserves as well. And, you know, they don't have claws, but these tails are very popular. People like to eat lobster, so there's a lot of fishing pressure on them, again, outside of the reserves. So let's try to see. I have bright lights here, so it's a little hard to see. But I'm going to call in Ranger Dan again or one of my support divers because I want to give the urchin back, or I'm sorry, the lobster back to them to, just like all those other animals, tuck it safely away, and that's Ranger Jeff, our other support diver, and also help protect that lobster. So today, we've actually, our divers have done a good job, and we've seen quite a few of the animals that rely on the kelp forest for survival, and we've talked a little bit about how this area is protected, and 
some of the importance of that, but also some of the threats. So are there any other threats that you guys can think of that could affect this area? Rachel Lizzie? Trash. Trash is a good one. That shark was a good example. But you know, when you throw something out, or if you have lunch on the beach, and you don't watch it, and the seagulls get into it, spread it all around, all of that trash, eventually a lot of it will blow into or wash down creeks, even if you're not at the beach, into the ocean, floats around out here, and even in the farthest reaches of the ocean, thousands of miles from land, there's still trash, plastics and things floating around. So, well, this is a beautiful area. It's relatively clean. It's relatively healthy. Pollution is also something that is threatening to it. Now, what can you do? Rachel Lindsay, does someone know? What can you do? What can they do to help protect this kelp forest and all the oceans from pollution and trash? Don't throw trash in the ocean. <laughs> That's right. I set up an easy question, but it's an important one. Don't throw trash in the ocean on purpose or accidentally by throwing trash away improperly outside of the ocean that will eventually make its way into the ocean. And so that's a great thing, an easy little thing we can all do. And collectively, when we all do that together, it has a really big effect in keeping the oceans clean. We talked about fishing and how a change in the amount of urchins due to fishing or other things, the shark fishing for their fins can have an effect on the balance of life here and how many animals there are. And so one thing you can do if you like to fish, fishing can be a great sport if you're interested in it. And a lot of us, myself included, like to eat fish, but we need to fish in a sustainable way, in a way that doesn't deplete too many of the fish so that we'll have large lobsters like that one we showed you to help reproduce and keep populations healthy and so just by being careful in how you fish following the rules don't fish in a marine reserve eat fish that are harvested or fished in a sustainable way you're helping the ocean so those are two really good ways there's a third way that I'm thinking of that you are all helping protect the ocean. And you know what? Whether you know it or not, you're doing it right now. You're learning about the ocean. And by learning about the ocean, you know more about it. You gain a better appreciation for it. And you can also tell other people what you've learned and help them become more knowledgeable, and that actually helps protect the ocean in a really big way. Not just the ocean, but the entire environment, even outside of the ocean. Everything is linked. Watersheds, rivers on the mainland, linked to the ocean. When you go up to the surface here, you go from underwater to the above water atmosphere. And remember, early on in this program, we talked about kelp and other marine algaes even producing a large amount, more than half, of all the oxygen on the planet. So this area, again, is not just important for the animals that live here that rely on it for survival, but we rely on the kelp forest for survival as well. So I hope you've learned a lot today and gotten that better appreciation to help protect the kelp forest. And I'd like to ask all of you to join me and take a deep breath. And as you exhale, realize that that deep breath, some of that oxygen came right here from the kelp forest. And we want to keep the kelp forest healthy, kelp forest healthy not just for us, not just for all those animals we saw today, but for our children and their children and their children, for all of the future generations as well. So, Rachel Lizzie, all the students and teachers from, and parents from Grace Hill, everybody here on Anacap and the Internet, thank you for joining us down here in the Kelp Forest today for Channel Islands Live. And I'll say goodbye from underwater. And those of you on the surface, I'll see you.